Uh, thank you for being here today. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you're with us as well. Thank you for joining us. Got a question for you as I start this morning. The question is this. When you were a kid, did you like fairy tales? Did you like fairy tales? I did. I loved fairy tales. I think it's part of being a kid. And as far as I'm concerned, the greatest translator of fairy tales had to be Walt Disney, right? I mean, his version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Cinderella, they're etched deep into our souls, right? Here's another question. When you were a kid, did you love the wonderful world of Disney, right? I loved everything about Disney. I loved the cartoons. I loved the movies. I loved the Mickey Mouse Club. I loved the Mouseketeers. When I was a kid, my dad loved dogs, and he loved stories about dogs. And when I was a, a very little boy, my dad took me to see a movie about a big red Irish setter named Big Red. Anybody ever see that movie? Okay. You got you to gotta be old, right, to see that. And <clears throat> later on, I got to see another movie about a dog called Old Yeller. Listen, if we could take a vote. Is that got to be the greatest movie of all time? I'm just saying. I just loved that movie as a kid. When I was working on this sermon this week, I actually discovered that Disneyland, not Disney World, which is in Florida, but Disneyland, which is now Anaheim, California, actually opened one week before I was born. One, exactly one week before I was born. So that tells you, young people, how old I am. It's getting pretty old. Uh, when Walt Disney was still around, this Disney com company was still about the family. It promoted family values, and it promoted family virtues. Very sadly, somewhere along the line, the Disney company was hijacked. It no longer is about family. In fact, the Disney company now is anti-family. It is probably the biggest promoter of leftist sexual politics in the world. And I find that very, very sad. And the hijacking of Disney is much like the hijacking of the meaning of the rainbow. If you'd like to know the real meaning of the rainbow, read the story of Noah in Genesis chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, and especially chapter 9. God tells us why there is a rainbow in the sky, and it's not the modern meaning that we have today. Well, I actually didn't come here to talk about leftist politics or rainbows. I've come to talk a little bit about the character of God. And the mention of fairy tales got me sidetracked because Walt Disney was so good at translating fairy tales. But Walt Disney actually cleaned up the fairy tales a lot before he could do anything with them. You might say that he Disney-fied the fairy tales. Originally, I don't know if you knew this, fairy tales had a very scary, dark side. For example... In the original Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the wicked queen who tries to kill Snow White is made to dance, get this, wearing a pair of red hot iron shoes until she falls over dead. And in the original Cinderella, the two mean stepsisters attend the royal wedding where Cinderella gets married to the prince, but then pigeons come and peck out their eyes. In The Little Mermaid, The Little Mermaid could only go on land if she drank a magic potion that made it feel like she was walking on sharp knives. She chose to do that because she loved the prince so much. But the prince married someone else. And she threw herself into the ocean and her body dissolved into sea foam. These are the original fairy tales. And they had harsh endings because they were intended to teach moral lessons. And the lessons were this. Number one, wickedness is always punished. That is, there comes a day of reckoning for bad actions. Behave badly and you will pay. And the second one is this. Choices have consequences. So think carefully before you act. 
You know, the Bible has many accounts that sound like fairy tales to people, but they're not fairy tales. These are actual historical events. Yet we tend to Disneyfy Bible stories. We remove or downplay or simply ignore the unpalatable parts and turn the stories into cutesy children's stories, like Disney did. For example, take the story of David and Goliath. We love the story about the little boy who beats the big bully Goliath, right? But we leave out the fact that David then cuts off his head and holds it up. And we leave out the fact that the road going from that battle scene is strewn with thousands of dead Philistines as the Israelites chase them down. Or take the story of Noah and the ark. When I was a kid, there were little arcs that you could play, little ark sets that you could play with. I don't know if anything like that exists anymore. But the reality is that God had to destroy the entire population of the earth, except for Noah, Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives. He saved eight people to repopulate the earth. But the story of Noah is one of destruction, God's judgment, God's justice. Or take Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel is rescued from the mouths of the lions when he's thrown into the lion's den. But afterwards, the king has the evil people thrown in, the ones who, who had been against Daniel, but it says they also threw their wives and their children in, and that the lions crushed their bones. We don't catch all those details because we turn them into little fairy tales. In this preaching series that we're calling Take the Land, God is sending Israel to conquer the land of Canaan. And his intention is to set up a godly kingdom to showcase God's character. I don't know why I'm already dry, but I am, so just excuse me for a minute. When we get to Jericho, we see that another example that is commonly sanitized, a biblical account which has been cleaned up so it sounds very nice. But all we remember about Jericho usually is, and the walls came a tumbling down, right? Like the song goes. But there was a lot more than that. You know, in Sunday school, when I was a kid, we would march around our classroom or march around the church, reenacting the story of Jericho, right? And of you ever do that? And we forget that every man, woman, boy, girl, and beast was killed in Jericho. And if you pause to think about that, you realize how sobering that is. It's, it's even gross, gruesome. The account of Jericho is another story in an almost unending line of stories about God's justice. It's another story that illustrates the New Testament truth of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 6. What does Romans chapter 3.23 say? For all have sinned. Everybody in the world, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then worse than that, if you don't get right with God, is Romans 6, 23, where it says, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Here's the fact. Our God is a very patient God. He puts up with a lot of of foolishness from mankind. But when his patience runs out, look out. You see it in the story of Noah, Genesis chapter 6 through 9. You see it in the story of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. You see it in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapters 18 and 19. You see it here in the story of Jericho. When I was a kid in Sunday school, I knew all of these stories. And I'm surprised today when I talk to people and I realize they have never read these stories. They have no idea about the patience of God and about His judgment because they've never read it. And here's what I would ask you to do. Do yourself a favor and go home and start reading the book of Genesis. 
I have no idea how we can have faith in the God of Abraham unless we've never read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. God has given us His story of the creation of the earth. History is His story. He's, he's given it to us in Genesis. And we, some of us have never read it. It's a fantastic read. Take the time, go home, start reading through the book of Genesis. In Genesis, you'll find that, number one, God put into place a plan to rescue the people of this world from judgment after Adam and Eve rebelled and after sin infected the human race. In Genesis, you'll also find out that God chose a pagan man. He called to him out of all the people of the earth. That man's name was Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Your people are going to multiply like the sand on the seashore, like the stars in the sky. Nobody will be able to count them. In Genesis, you find out that God promised many things through Abraham, the greatest of which was the promise of a Savior who would save this world. And that, of course, was Jesus Christ. But the part of the promise that involved a homeland for Israel is a promise that continues all the way to this day. Israel is now where they are in Palestine for one reason. God says, this is your land, and it will be forever, because you are my people forever. Isn't that awesome? The, the fourth thing we learn in Genesis is that God promised that he would remove the people who were living in that land when their wickedness rose to such a level that God would be forced to act in judgment. Here's what we read in Genesis chapter 15. This is to Abraham. God says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. What was he talking about? God already was telling Abraham something he could not know because it was his uh, grandson, Jacob, who would end up going down into Egypt so, so Abraham was dead and gone before this ever happened. But he says, your children are going to come back here in the fourth generation. 400 years they were captives in Egypt. He says, but your children are going to come back here after the sins of the Amorites have reached their full measure. And then I'm going to act in judgment against them. The Canaanite tribes who lived in that promised homeland that God had promised to Abraham were evil and yet God was patient with them. He wasn't yet willing to destroy them. He eventually would, but he wasn't ready at that time. Here's what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 9. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. He's talking to the Israelites, okay? No, no, no. He says, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God is going to drive them out before you to accomplish what He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess for you are a stiff-necked people. That is the history of the Jewish people. They were always a stiff-necked people, and I, I think to this day they still remain a stiff-necked people. They, they cannot admit that the Savior has come. God knew them, knew they were stubborn, but you know what? He's got to use somebody. And, and I, I remember the little statement that says, how ought of God to choose the Jews? But He did. And we can say the same thing about ourselves because many times we're stiff-necked people. For 400 years, I think God had this day circled on His calendar, so to speak, to judge the Canaanites for their offensive sins. You say, well, is that fair? Should God have done that? And let's not judge God ever. God is holy. God has His reasons. God cannot stand to look upon sin. In 1929, archaeologists were doing a dig in what is now the country of Syria in a little town called Ras Shamra. And it shows us just how sinful the Canaanite people were. 
Here are some of their practices. The Canaanites sacrificed their own babies. They burned them alive in fire, sacrificing the, to their gods. They worshipped idols that they made with their own hands. They had temples that, excuse me, where they practiced sexual orgies as part of their worship with both male and female prostitutes. They practiced witchcraft and sorcery and divination. And through Joshua, God is finally going to bring judgment. He's going to fulfill that 400-year-old promise that he made to Abraham. Finally, the sins of the Canaanites have reached their tipping point, and God has run out of patience. Now to the Jericho account. If you want to put a label on this, let's call it fighting for God's promises. There are some notes in your outline, if, uh, outline notes if you want to see that in your sermon guide. And there, point number one is this. When taking a stand on something, make sure that you fight the right fight. Fight the right fight. The Jericho starts with a curious episode. In Joshua chapter 5, we read this. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So what's up with his angel? God is telling Joshua that the Lord is a holy warrior. And it is the Lord himself who is going to fight for Israel and sweep the wicked from the land in judgment. Yes, Israel is going to join in the fight, but there's going to be an invisible army of angels fighting alongside of them. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, we see God making a promise to his people through Moses. And here's what he said to the Israelite people. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hivites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations that are larger and stronger than you, when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. With Jericho, the moment of truth has come. The day of battle has arrived. And the last word of assurance that God gives to Joshua says this, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Before the attack on Jericho had even started, God says, don't worry about it. I've got it. It's already done, as far as I'm concerned. Don't you think there are times in our lives when we worry and fret about things that we're not supposed to worry and fret about? God has given us so many promises, like, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I have your best interests at heart, always. And do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? If you're worrying and fretting about anything, then you are fighting the wrong fight. You're fighting the wrong fight. God says, I've got you in the palm of my hand. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. He said, not one sparrow, get this, not one sparrow can fall to the ground without God knowing it. And the very hairs on your heads are all numbered. So don't worry. We are more valuable to him than many sparrows. That's Jesus' promise to us. So why do we worry? 
Let's resist the temptation to fight the wrong fight. Let's just trust God. When he says he's going to be with us, he means it. Well, while it's important to fight the right fight, it's also important, number two, to fight the right way. Fight the right way. That's point number two in your sermon notes. In Joshua chapter 6, God says, March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone will go straight in. Let me ask you a question. Where did this battle strategy come from? Did it come from a group of generals sitting around the war table making their plans? No. God is the one who designed this battle plan, right down to the last detail. Now, when Joshua heard the battle plan ahead of time, he must have thought, what? Walk around the city once on day one and on day two, walk around it again and so on. Probably seemed like a big waste of time and energy, but it was God's plan. It was God's plan, and it worked. You know what? There are times in our lives when God is simply saying, will you just wait? And we're thinking, I'm wasting a lot of time here. I'm wasting a lot of energy, and God says, no, 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 it's my plan. Just wait. So what are we going to do while we wait? Keep praying. Keep praying. Resist the temptation to lean on your own understanding. Here's the application. Wait carefully for God's deliverance in your life. And while you're waiting and praying, read. Read. What are you supposed to read? The Bible, God's Word. His plan for you is in His Word. Honor Him by living in His Word. The Bible says in Isaiah, when we honor Him, He will honor us. Honor Him by being obedient to Him and reading His Word. What's point number three? Fight for God's glory. Fight for God's glory. I don't know why I'm so dry today, but here I go. Here's what we read Joshua chapter 6. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak, marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. And the seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. That's a very important phrase. Everything in the city is to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies that we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble upon it. All the silver and gold, and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into His treasury. The term devoted to the Lord translates a Hebrew term that refers to the total giving over of things or persons to the Lord. Everything, complete devotion. It's a far more serious word than dedicated. Devoted is much more serious than the word dedicated. In Leviticus 27, it says this, But nothing that a person owns and devotes to the Lord, whether a human being or an animal or family land may be be sold or redeemed. Everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. No No person devoted to destruction may be ransomed. They are to be put to death. God views 
both the touching and the taking of something that has been devoted to him as stealing. And we're going to see this played out next week with the story of Achan who took some of those devoted things. The people of Jericho and all the contents of the city were devoted to God. They were set aside for judgment for their sin. All the metals were going to be kept in God's treasury to prevent the people from later later sifting through the ashes to see if they could find a piece of silver or a piece of gold. No, everything is devoted to God. Don't, Don't even think about taking anything. It's an interesting and important point that the destruction of Jericho was a unique act of God, bringing wicked people to judgment. Now get this, it was never an act of genocide on the part of the Israelites. It was not the Israelites who decided this. God decided this. They were following God's orders, and the Israelites were simply God's hand of justice. How does this apply to us today? The entire world, everybody in this world is under a death sentence from God. God created mankind, put him in a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. He even came and spent time with Adam and Eve every day and walked with them and talked with them in the garden. They were his children. He loved them as children. And what happened? Adam and Eve rebelled. They sided with God's enemy, the devil, and chose to become the gods of their own lives. And the Bible calls that sin. And that sin was then passed on to their children and to their children, generation to generation to generation, all the way to us. God does not tolerate sin. And God will not turn a blind eye to sin. He is patient, and He does give people time to repent, but eventually His judgment always comes. God reserves the right to bring that judgment anytime He chooses. When we sin, we deserve the immediate consequence of the death penalty. Yet for most of us, because of God's grace, judgment is delayed, often for decades, a lifetime. But sometimes, God exercises His right to judge sooner, like He did with Jericho. We are so accustomed to His grace, aren't we, that we complain when judgment comes sooner than we expected. John 3.16 is arguably the most well-known verse in the Bible. Many of you have memorized it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. But are you familiar with this verse, just 20 verses later? From the same chapter, John 3.36, it says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Note that word carefully, that word remains. God's wrath is already upon every person who rejects Christ. What do we have to do to have God's wrath remain on us? Nothing. Just do nothing. His judgment is already there waiting, hovering due to our past record of sin. God would be totally fair to have already carried out His death sentence on us. That would be fair. But He is a reluctant judge. His compassion causes Him to delay judgment. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness, Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But His patience is not endless. Remember that. His patience is not endless. So let's make a little application here to us as a church, as the Rock Church. 
This account of Jericho has some bearing on why we are planting a new campus in Hamden. This isn't Pastor Kirk's idea or somebody else. This is God's idea. Just as the people of Bangor and the people of Old Town, where we already have campuses, are under the righteous judgment of God, so there are many good people living in Hamden right now who are under the judgment of God, and they don't even know it. Nobody's telling them about that. But ignorance doesn't solve the problem. Ignorance doesn't fix anything. The Apostle Paul warned us that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. If this is true, then we must warn the people of Hamden. We must give them a chance to hear about God's grace through Jesus Christ. So what is a new campus going to do in Hamden? A new campus is going to attract new people. They're going to be people who are curious. What is going on with that new church over there? And because, it's, because people are curious, they're going to come and see. And people are going to invite them. And many people from Hamden are going to find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We need to give them a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the mission of the Rock Church? The mission of the Rock Church is to turn the people of Maine into wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to need people in Hamden. We're going to need workers in Hamden to carry out this mission, to be missionaries of a sort. And right now we're building a launch team, and we have a great start. But we have need of a lot more people to go to Hamden and make a difference in that community. So here's what we're going to ask people to do as they join a launch team. We're going to ask people to commit to attending services in Hamden for one year. Just make that commitment. Yes, I will go. I will be a missionary to Hamden. And for one year, I will attend services in Hamden. Also, they're going to be committed to serving in some kind of ministry. Wherever they fit in, wherever they want to serve, but serving somewhere. They're also going to commit to attending one worship service and serving one worship service every week that they can. Serve one and sit through one and worship God. And at the end of one year, we're going to say, okay, the church is established. Things are going well. You make your choice. Do you want to go back to Bangor or do you want to go back to Old Town? Go back if you want or you can stay in Hamden that point, it's going to be your decision. So here's what we're doing during this season. As we're getting ready to launch in September, we're asking you to pray for lost people. Let's start praying for Hamden. We're going to ask you also to invite lost people. We're going to invite you to, if you want to be part of this launch team, come. We're going to have a weekly meeting once a week for four, I think it's four or five weeks in the month of August, so it's coming right up, where we're going to train you for what you can do in Hamden. Not just going to throw you in there and say, good luck. No, there's going to be some training several times during the month of August. And also we're going to ask you to sign a commitment card and say, yeah, I'm all in. I'm going to do this right now in your worship guide. There's an opportunity to find that if you want to do that. There's a QR code there. You can Let your camera hover over that, click on it, and you can sign up right now if you want to do that. Let me wrap up this message with these thoughts. When God told Moses in Exodus chapter 34 what kind of God he was, he listed eight traits, and he passed in front of Moses. Here's what it says. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, he repeats it, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. 
He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations. So what are the characteristics of God? They're listed right there. God is compassionate. He's gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness, maintains love to thousands, forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And we love those. We celebrate those, and rightly so. But we are guilty of Disneyfying God's Word <laughs> if we leave off the unpleasant end. Because the eighth characteristic of God is that He does not leave the guilty unpunished. That's who God is. God is always just. And just like if somebody murdered our children, we would want justice. God always gives justice. Traits one through seven, all the nice things about God, do not cancel out trait number eight. Jesus is willing to wash away our sin if we confess it to him and repent of it. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> our Father... Thank you for your word. Thank you that it is true. Thank you that your word is quick and powerful, sharp as a two-edged sword, and dividing bone and marrow, soul and spirit. Lord, perhaps there's someone here this morning, someone watching online, and they don't know you. They've never repented of their sin. But this message this morning, you speaking into our hearts, has touched them. Dear God, would you draw them by your spirit? Would you help them confess their sin to you and help them turn their life over to you so that they don't have to face your eternal judgment? And if that's you this morning and you'd like to pray and you don't even know how to pray, but you don't want to be left out, I'm going to offer a simple prayer right now. You can pray with me. Whether you're here in this room or watching online, you can pray this prayer with me in your heart. If it's your desire to commit your life to Jesus Christ, would you pray this prayer with me? Here it is. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for my sin. I confess that I am a sinner. Forgive me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Help me, O oh God, to begin to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.